All right, as promised last week, here we are, the feminine mystique and campus rape myth. Now, I want to be extremely clear here. I support giving benefit of the doubt to people who report sexual assault because statistically, most people do tell the truth in those situations. So don't go saying that I'm a rape apologist or that I don't take sexual assault seriously. I take it very seriously. I'm not dealing with the serious social problem of sexual coercion. I'm focusing on the elements of campus life that fixate on sexual assault to an unhealthy degree, that inflate statistics and use misleading data to make an already very serious problem seem bigger than it is. This leads to unnecessary fear and this holds women back. Furthermore, Every time a hoaxer fools the press, it makes things worse for people who have to report actual crimes. So if you can't handle any examination of statistics or programs connected to sexual assault, stop watching now, okay? Okay, you have been warned. You may have heard that one in five female college students is the victim of sexual assault. This is a statistic that even the scientists who ran the study say can't be used as a national baseline. It only focused on two schools. Despite this, you hear the statistic repeated over and over and over again. The actual rape statistic from the two schools studied was one in seven, which is more in line with other similar studies. And that's still a staggeringly high number. So why the need to inflate it further? Furthermore, why does it seem like fear of rape for women in university is more newsworthy than the actual education of women in university? Mattress Girl gets way more headlines than Valedictorian Girl. Chapter 7 of The Feminine Mystique dealt with something Betty Friedan labeled sex-directed education. The ways women were educated that differed from the ways men were educated. To this day, the different attitudes towards teaching boys and teaching girls have led to some profound found observed outcomes. As early as the fifth grade, researchers see differences in how girls and boys are trained to approach difficult problems. Girls are conditioned to believe that being good or smart is something innate. Boys are encouraged to see skills as things they can acquire. So when faced with something hard, women are more likely to give up because they just can't do it. Because of the way video games are structured as a series of acquired skills, I think they can be excellent tools to rewire girls' conditioning in this regard. Ferdan also observed how young women are given specialized additional education in sexual function. This includes the pressures to dress modestly, wear a bra even if you don't need one, just in case, always wear a slip so boys don't see through your skirt. This is all a distraction. Women are constantly using a portion of our attention to preserve our modesty, the way we sit, smile, dress, even wear our hair. Ferdan believed that this was telling girls approaching puberty that they were defined by their reproductive organs. The focus on being not slutty was taking away from recognition of other skills and talents in women. We see this today in the discussion of video games all the time. Betty Ferdan also explored the phenomenon of women getting junk degrees. Yes, men get junk degrees too, but that isn't used to explain away the stubbornly persistent compensation gap. Back in the 1950s, educational interest for women had dropped off because it was seen as something that would just frustrate women in their natural role of mother. Educators were believed to be defeminizing women. Going to college was still expected, but doing something useful with that college degree was not. Women were being dissuaded from certain life paths through powerful social messaging. This is possibly hard to relate to today with the encouragements for women to become doctors, lawyers, get into politics, and so on. However, there's still a lot of negative social messaging aimed at career women. Scare tactics regarding having children later in life. Horror stories of burnout for female doctors. Sexual harassment of female politicians and financiers. The constant slut shaming and body shaming of any woman in the media. And, of course, the oft-repeated myth that the video game industry treats women uniquely horribly, right alongside the persistent myth that men are naturally better at tech pursuits. Recently, criminal defense lawyer Marie Hennen was accused of being a gender traitor for her aggressive cross-examination of the complainants in the Gian Gomeshi sexual assault trial. While her cross-examination was withering and 
did hinge on more than a few stereotypes that had everything to do with her being a lawyer working the system to defend her client and nothing to do with her being a woman or a traitor to women. Her advice follows a report by the Criminal Lawyers Association suggesting that women are dropping out of criminal law practice at higher rates than men. Most respondents to a CLA survey in December cited the unpredictability of work hours and income and the difficulty of having kids while working in criminal law as probable reasons for quitting the profession. Instead of high-powered industries coming out with creative solutions to these sorts of issues, they're just amassing media horror stories and driving women back towards more traditionally female lines of work that pay less. So can you really say it's self-selecting into lesser paying careers when the choice seems to be lower pay or constant misery? What woman in her right mind enters an industry that gets prominently featured on Law & Order Special Victims Unit? Instead of get back in the kitchen, the new social messaging is go home, gamer girl. And yes, internet trolls feast on this stuff because trolls are trolls. But trolls provide a very useful service in that they highlight the strongest cultural myths at play at any given time. Trolls aren't currently exploiting the idea that gamers hate women because it's true. They're exploiting that idea because people believe it. Most modern men don't still tell women to make them a sandwich. Trolls do. Why? Because it's abhorrent. A product of the normalization of rape myth in our culture is that the idea that all men are secret monsters is a surprisingly easy sell, despite a mountain of evidence to the contrary. Women are trained from birth to be afraid of our own shadows. We're trained to fear men but also rely on men for our safety. The stronger this messaging gets, the more women see ourselves, our education, and our careers through a perspective that uses men as the base point that we compare ourselves against, at least according to Betty Friedan. Instead of being taught the factual realities of sexual situations, women are fed a bunch of propaganda. Sex-directed education starts as soon as parents start surrounding a baby girl with pink, pink, and more pink. Why does any child still pooping in her diapers need to live inside a Pepto-Bismol bottle? Fast forward to adulthood, and today, as in Betty Friedan's day, men and women are getting degrees because their parents insist they need a degree. But these degrees are not necessarily meaningful. The role of a bachelor degree, note the name, has evolved from training to qualify for specific employment to the baseline level of education to get most jobs. Essentially, a bachelor degree is high school plus. Since any degree will do, young women who don't yet know what they want to do take courses that will teach them to woman better. Psychology, sociology, and of course, women's studies. Don't get me wrong, understanding of gender is important, but this understanding is more useful when it's applied to a greater context. For instance, you're probably interested in these videos because you want to see how gender theory specifically applies to video game design and culture, because that's what makes it relevant to your brain. It's important to make professionals aware of potentially ingrained gender biases in their given fields, but it needs to be applied to that field with some degree of precision to make it relevant. For instance, providing on-site childcare in an office building means that the hours of that daycare can adapt to the needs of the business. However, putting a daycare in a police station where violent criminals are coming and going all day is probably not the best idea. But how does this connect to the exaggeration of campus rape statistics? Well, in a few ways. One is a dehumanization factor. Sexual assault is framed as something done to women by men instead of something done to an individual by an individual or a group of individuals. Ugh. This makes rape survivor an identity to a greater degree than labels on people who are the victims of other crimes. A guy who gets beat up in a bar fight doesn't self-define as a battery survivor. A woman who loses the use of her legs after a car accident doesn't identify as an attempted vehicular manslaughter survivor. It's not good to define yourself based on what's done to you as opposed to what you do. It can make you feel pretty helpless. Betty Friedan theorized that women couldn't get as much out of their college educations because their identity was too sexualized. Now, this didn't mean that they were wearing things that would make Kim Kardashian blush. Quite the contrary. Women were petrified of seeming the least bit cheap or loose or pushy or brainy because of marriage concerns. 
these days that hyper awareness of an over sexualized identity manifests in young women preoccupied by fears of rape and they attend post secondary institutions more interested in activism than education. A major change in the college experience from Betty Friedan's day is the social acceptance of being sexually active outside of marriage. Friedan observed that colleges used to delay sexual activity, at, at least in theory. Keep in mind that the birth control pill wasn't approved as a contraceptive until 1960. Thanks in part to the pill, now sexual exploration is part of the college experience. And we have women who have an overdeveloped sense of sexual identity doing and saying things they don't entirely understand. At the core of this behavior is an identity that hinges on seeming sexual, but not too sexual. Women live in fear of not being taken seriously the minute they're seen as sexually active, with some cause. Meanwhile, young men who aren't educated nearly enough in the female perspective or experience are walking into murky consent situations. The campus rape hysteria currently gripping North America is neither gender's fault. Both men and women are victims of a system that sends them mixed messages, lays on heavy amounts of guilt, and encourages young people to define themselves based on what is done to them as opposed to what they do. Some college girls are still, as Betty Friedan put it, fulfilling all desire for achievement, status, and identity vicariously through a man. Some are just doing it through an identity of a rape survivor instead of as a wife. This is a contentious statement, I'm aware, but the facts fit. We think of rape as a crime, but sexual assault, the threat of sexual assault, living in environments where sexual assault is a constant topic, and the shame that follows a sexual assault are also serious social problems. Some even refer to this normalization of rape and rape myth as rape culture. Now, more traditionally, rape culture is seen as condoning rape. But I maintain that even the constant fixation on rape in the process of advocacy contributes to rape culture. Let me put it to you this way. The rape and sexualized murder of women is seen as appropriate content for basic network television, but exposed breasts or graphic depictions of consensual sex are kicked up to the cable tier where there's less censorship. A woman as victim of sexual violence is seen by our society to be less offensive than a woman who is naked engaging in consensual sex. Because of the way the media ranks offense, a lot of discussions of sex happen via discussions of sexual assault. Rape is normalized to a far greater degree than mature conversations about consensual sexual encounters. That's rape culture. And it's messed up. Rape is terrible and far too common, especially in poorer communities where people don't trust the police. Trust me, I grew up in one of those communities. Because sexual assault is a situation marginalized people already have to confront too often, statistics don't need to be embellished. In certain African-American communities, one in five women actually is raped. Canadian Aboriginal women are two and a half times more likely than non-Aboriginal women to be victims of gendered violence. Inflating sexual assault statistics in more privileged groups is pulling attention away from the communities that need the most help and are least likely to get that help. Furthermore, it's limiting and misleading to frame dating violence and intimate partner violence as something that's exclusively done to women by men. These types of attacks can be perpetrated by anyone and happen to anyone. And just because it happens to men less, doesn't mean the issue should be framed like it doesn't happen to men at all. A man is more likely to be sexually assaulted himself than have someone lie about him sexually assaulting them. One in 33 men is sexually assaulted, making them one out of every 10 survivors. 50% of transgender people have been sexually abused or assaulted. So why aren't we talking about sexual violence as something that happens to all genders so we can help all people who need it. According to Betty Friedan's work, it could be because people who aren't cisgendered men are far more likely to frame their own personal experiences based on fears of how cisgendered men are perceiving them. Perceived male power makes men seem scary. Some studies say that as many as one in 10 men commit rape in college. That number seems 
terrifying until you realize that means that 90% of men don't commit rape, which is the vast majority. All men are not potential rapists. It's important to consider what it does to the perceptions of young people of all genders when they're being fed more fear than necessary. The campus policies that strip men of due process rights, condemn them as guilty until proven innocent, and otherwise take leave of any rationality are based on the idea that male power and male approval are the primary dynamics at play. This compounds the perception that women are not self-sufficient. Women cannot be equally empowered until women are seen to be equally accountable. This is a concept that has persisted since the first wave started. There's no shortcut around that. These policies intended to help women are actually infantilizing women, similar to the way colleges treated women like children in the 1950s. A side effect of this tendency to treat women like non-adults is that many activists refuse to acknowledge that false rape accusations are a real phenomenon and justice can't sidestep the concept of innocent until proven guilty. As I said, the idea of rape is horrible, but the idea that someone could lie about being raped is in a lot of ways even more horrible. Now let's be clear here, every statistic on this issue says that false accusations are the minority. Implying that the vast majority of women lie about being raped is just as wrong as saying all men are potential rapists. None of it's true. The problem is that we don't know with any certainty how small that false accusation minority is. We can prove 2 to 8% of rape accusations are false. We know 3% of sexual assault trials result in a conviction. Between these two certainties is a giant void of we have no idea who's telling the truth. In a courtroom, that's called reasonable doubt. In the general world, it's a messy, ugly reality. And it indicates that we shouldn't be taking away the due process rights of male college students. Now, this doesn't mean you should automatically doubt a friend who says they've been assaulted. Because the assumption is that they're your friend. Because they're truthful and trustworthy. And if you know someone well, you have a much better sense of whether or not they're telling the truth in a given situation. What it does mean is we shouldn't infantilize women by believing we're less capable of lying than men. Some women do deceive, even about very serious things, sometimes because of mental illness, sometimes out of sheer spite. Our legal system is based on the concept that it's a greater evil to convict an innocent person than to let a guilty person go, That's why the paradigm is innocent until proven guilty. This is an especially sensitive subject in the African-American community because of the history of white women having consensual sex with black men, then calling it rape when they're caught. The novel To Kill a Mockingbird deals with the black men being sent to jail on these sort of false accusation pretenses. In that story, the very idea that Tom Robinson should receive a defense is offensive to the locals. The white women anti-rape advocacy that denies this reality through a simplistic believe survivors narrative is being heartlessly ignorant of this historical fact linked to racial divisions. Things like this put black women in an enviable place where they have to choose between their womanhood and their blackness, which is why some black feminists have a relatively low opinion of white feminist work like Betty Friedan's. An approach that divides instead of unifies isn't a good policy And this is what we've got here. In a society that didn't punish women for sexual activity, rape would not be a fate worse than death. But in our reality, there's still this idea that rape leaves a woman defiled in a way that other physical assaults don't. The problem isn't that a woman is less capable, less intelligent, or less well-spoken after being sexually assaulted. The problem is that she's seen by herself and those around her as less whole. This is defining a woman by her body in the way that Betty Friedan warned against. There's a reason it's called losing your virginity instead of gaining sexual experience. Now, does this mean we should stop trying to improve the piss poor conviction rate on sexual assault cases? No, it means we should tear down the social stigmas that treat survivors of sexual violence like irreparably damaged goods. It deprives people of hope and takes over too much of their world. And that sort of sex-directed education is alive and well today in the safe space culture of modern college campuses. These forms of education, 
aren't preparing women for the big bad world of work where we're challenged and expected to defend our views. These forms of education are training women to be afraid of the world and in need of some sort of external protector. Men are expected to navigate an environment where they can face rape accusations and get stripped of their due process rights by the school. Think that's unfair? Too bad. Deal. Meanwhile, women are offered coloring books and rooms used to avoid scary words and pictures. Now, you're an HR director at a company. Which type of applicant would you rather hire? This sort of sex-directed education where men are to expect challenges and women aren't is precisely the sort of thing Betty Friedan warned about in The Feminine Mystique. It's an educational focus for women on life adjustment as opposed to hard education. Betty Friedan noted that the lack of challenge in college stunts women, making them childish. Her words, not mine. She also outlined some moves colleges made to change things, not because they were the right things to do, but because they were popular with students. Sound familiar? It shouldn't matter how popular due process and free speech are with students. They're pillars of Western thought, and educators should be educating students on their importance. Today, as in the 1960s, scholars who don't toe this gendered line are forced out of leadership roles because, according to Betty Friedan, female students are more comfortable being indoctrinated into their feminine role by male instructors who wouldn't challenge the gender binary. The woman scholar was suspect just by virtue of being one, she said. Today, speakers like Christina Hoff Summers and Kathy Young are subjects of noisy protests at college campuses, while speakers like Anita Sarkeesian are treated like damsels in distress. Why do we respect some women enough to be allowed to hate them, but not others? This isn't a question of whether you agree or disagree with these speakers. You can even think their ideas are dangerous if you choose. But the entire point of college is supposed to be based on the assumption that it's adult education. You're there to confront difficult ideas to hone your critical thinking skills. I encountered some crazy opinions from professors when I was in university, like the anthropology professor with no medical training who insisted that incest was a social taboo and had no medical consequences. I worry that young women in college now are being denied these difficult but essential experiences, and it's resulting in women graduating college without one of the core benefits of college. Growing the hell up. Even in the working world of video games and tech, women are being defined by what's done to them, not what they do. Many of the most prominent women in gaming voices outside of gaming are well known because they have an identity of being victims of harassment. Their achievements, status, and identity came via what men did to them, not what they did. Now, within gaming, we have achievement-driven women like Rihanna Pratchett, Amy Henning, and Jade Raymond, who have some name recognition. But other highly placed women in gaming are names you probably don't recognize. You don't see their achievements splashed across headlines in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and Time Magazine the way stories of poor, abused women make waves. And there's one element of Betty Friedan's The Feminine Mystique I touched on last week I want to reiterate now. It's relevant to modern gamers. Marketers don't just sell products. They sell lifestyles that encourage maximum consumption of those products. Like the bored housewives of the 1950s, gamers are associated with a lifestyle that keeps us at home and minimizes real-life adult social contact. Because if we're out having a life, we're not home downloading overpriced DLC. Trophies, achievements, and community events attempt to maximize the amount of time we spend playing a particular product because the exact same executives who sold Bleach to housewives are now selling video games to gamers. The more life makes us unhappy, the more we escape into games. The more we escape into games, the more money we spend on those games. Like women who work outside the home, a well-rounded gamer is more selective and more critical in his or her purchases. The gamers who see gaming as a profession, either because of achievement hunting or esports, spend a lot more money on games, controllers, chairs, headphones, and other peripherals than a gamer who just plays for fun. Professional housewife, meet professional gamer. You're both being sold a bill of goods that's keeping you from your full potential. In essence, you're being manipulated into misery. That was the message of the feminine mystique, and that was the wake-up call that kicked off second-wave feminism. It's not unlike the way gamers today are mad as hell and not going to take it anymore. Welcome to your revolution, fellow gamers. 
Guess what? Second wave feminists got a lot of the same smears thrown at them you're getting today. They were called frustrated, crazy, ridiculous, bitter, embarrassing, man-hating, libelous, unfair, envious, stupid, and petty. And those were the nice words. Second wave feminists were seen as angry and entitled by the status quo, just like gamers are now. And their message was similar to what I'm hearing gamers say today. Stop treating us like we're less of a person than you are. But what was achieved by the second wave of feminism? What lessons can we take from it that are relevant today? That's what we'll look at in our next installment.